My guest today is Chris Richards. Chris is a mindset mentor for six-figure entrepreneurs who recognize that after focusing on their marketing, sales, and business strategies, the final barrier to achieve success they desire is usually something hidden within themselves. His clients regularly go from earning ten to twenty thousand U.S. dollars per month to over a hundred thousand dollars per month and beyond, but they do it without fears, old money thinking patterns, anxiety, or old habits getting in the way. In addition to being a certified coach, Chris has a wealth of experience and expertise in psychology. He's developed a very special hypnosis method, which combines the best of cognitive behavior therapy, hypnotherapy, neurology, and evidence-based positive reinforcement conditioning. Wow, what a mouthful. Chris, welcome to the Go For Launch <laughs> podcast. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for having me, Brandon. Really appreciate it. Absolutely. My first question always is, where are you in the world today? I am in Salisbury in the UK. Uh, so very, very near to Stonehenge. Okay, excellent. Well, we'll be hopefully divining some ancient wisdom from the gods for, for today's podcast <laughs> from Stonehenge. You know, that's, did, that's my secret. That's actually I, my secret. Correct. I, I source the, the energy directly from them. So yeah, it because works beautifully. How did they get there? You know? It must have been the ancient right. aliens because I watched that program. But uh, all right. So Chris, <laughs> you work with a lot of six figure entrepreneurs, people that are making $100,000 plus, whether it's in dollars yeah. or euros or however. These are typically people that, in my experience, at least who are passionate, they're hardworking, they've achieved a certain level of success. But then they come mm. to you because they're dealing with certain issues that are holding them back. What are some of those common issues that entrepreneurs face? Well, it's a very good question. Um, it, it's really broken down into two, which is what is the common problem they think they're facing? And what is the common problem that they actually end up realizing that they're facing? Um, generally speaking, what they come to me with is, you know, they want to charge more, they want to charge more for their services without uh, fear that they're not going to be able to deliver. Uh, on that on that amount um you know they 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 it's imposter syndrome it's perfectionism it's uh you know putting things off that they know they should do and 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 a, and a variety of other uh ways to describe essentially not doing something that they otherwise want to do know how to do uh have all the tools to do but for some reason they're just just not quite getting through and doing it um now, the second part, which is what is actually happening, is more often than not around self-worth mm. and their identity as a whole, um, who they believe they are and who they believe they're not, um, and tangled in there completely in all kinds of bits and, and wonderful ways is the thing that we call self-worth. Um, you know, that good, that feeling of good enoughness. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's usually woven in there and, and tangled up in all kinds of knots um, where they've got a lot of evidence to suggest uh, and, and prove that they know what they're doing, they're good at what they do, um, they can absolutely deliver and all these different things. Uh, but there's also this need to prove themselves, this need to be someone, this need to be this top leader. And, uh, and, and it's generally speaking, when they see me, I'm usually one of the last people they call they have they have got all their systems in place they've got all their funnels in place they know how to do their sales they know how to do their marketing um and that the, as, as as you said um so wonderfully in the intro thank you it is the is that last piece is just themselves um because they've they've ticked every other box and they're still not hitting the mark that they want to hit in their business uh, not doing the income consistently. Um, now, how do they find? Yeah, so so how do they find you, Chris? Are they in such pain that they're on Google, uh, typing in certain keywords <laughs> and searching for a solution that pops up Chris Richards' website, or how you know how do most people find you in in Stonehenge next to Stonehenge in England or whatever? <laughs> okay, uh, again, generally speaking, through my social media. Okay. Um, I show up, I show up consistently. I give great value, um, to those who receive it. Um, I get an awful lot of referrals. A lot of people who work with me push other people towards me. Uh, I'm very grateful for that. 
Um, although some people, I, I will admit that some of them would prefer me to be their best kept secret. Mm. Um, well, who wants to say because... I'm having hypnotherapy, you know, cause I'm so messed well, up. No. I mean, I mean, it's not just, <laughs> it's not just hypnotherapy. Hypnosis is, is a tool in the toolbox. That's just one tool. Um, there's also a lot, there's, there's talk therapies that I use. There's general coaching that I use. There's mentoring that I use. Uh, I do a lot of somatic work, which is that connection to the body, um, and a lot of energetic work as well. Um, although a lot of it, evidence-based energetics is what I call it. Oh, nice. Um, okay. so, so it's evidence-based energetics, um, you know, flow state, things like that. Um, so it's, it's a whole mismatch of, of, of essentially a toolbox used for the individual in a way that the individual would best receive it. I see. Um, one thing I one thing I don't like is one of these you know sausage factory type programs where you go in one end, you go through step A, B, C, and D, and then you come out the other end. Mm. Um, I believe in having enough tools and enough methods and enough techniques to be able to tailor the uh, experience depending on what that individual needs at any given point. Um, uh, and at the speed that that person uh, heals and, and processes and grows, because we don't all grow at the same speed. We don't all do the same things. And uh, a lot of the programs out there today are either far too academic uh, and are quite frankly dull mm-hmm. uh, and boring, or they or they don't have the technolo- uh, te- uh, the technical sound um, basis behind them, and they're very kind of fluffy and airy fairy and like. What I like to do is get enough of a balance for that person that that person will resonate with the most uh, to get them where they want to go. Now, so I've got... hypnosis is a great tool for that. Okay, I have so many tools. This is fascinating. I have a lot of questions <laughs> to continue with, Please. Chris. But you know, does this work? You know, obviously in COVID, we've been going on almost a year plus with this. Oh, uh, yeah. At, you know, has this impacted you? In other words, is it best for you to sit one-on-one face-to-face doing this? Number one, is is that true? And if you've had to adjust, how have you adjusted so that you can do this virtually as well? Okay, so actually pretty much all of my work is done virtually. Mm. Um, a lot of people think of seeing, a, a, especially if it's just a hypnotherapist mm-hmm. where that's all they do. They just, you come in, you receive hypnosis, you leave. Um, Same as somebody else who's maybe a psychologist. You go in, you do talk therapy, you talk about your problem, you dissect it into the thoughts, the behaviors, and the feelings. You see what is and not what you want to see and all these kinds of things, and then you leave. Uh, Then you go to a somatics person, and they have you reconnecting with your body. How are you feeling in this moment? What are the sensations, the impulses? And then you just do that bit. The beauty of being able to do a lot of this work virtually, uh, and and to answer your question, it hasn't changed much because I mean most of my clients are in America, Australia, uh, and around the world. Okay. So, um, I've I've I'm trying to tick off. I'm, in fact, that'd be a nice game um, to see how many countries I can color in to get yeah. to get clients in different countries. I'm, I'm pretty sure the majority of the world would be covered if by the time I'd finished. Wow. Um, um, I say done most of Europe. I've had clients in, in virtually every client, every country in Europe, Australia, lots in America, lots in the UK. Um, yeah. So, uh, it'd be interesting. Actually, I might do that just for fun. Yeah, it'd be great. Put that on your website. Say, like, you know, yeah. we, we're missing Botswana. Or we're missing, you know, so yeah, yeah. A couple, we're missing a client from Botswana. We're yeah. missing, uh, we need a couple, stuff. a couple more Absolutely. to fill in the map. Um, so. the, there was a big change I had to do because I've, I've got two kids. I've got two beautiful daughters. Um, and so I did have to adapt, though. So one of the things that I had to do was move all of my sessions into the evening. Mm. Uh because a big, big, big value of mine is that family connection. Mm-hmm. Um, so my mentality was um, I'm going to have to trim right down on what my commitments are uh, because I just don't have the time and I can't delegate certain things I can't delegate. So let's trim back the fat. And actually COVID was brilliant for me because mm-hmm. it really helped me focus on what it is I'm doing, who, what my main energy is going towards. And, 
so I'd have these calls at sort of nine, ten o'clock at night uh, after helping my eldest daughter with her schoolwork during the day, uh, you know, playing with my youngest daughter. She's like learning shapes and colors. So okay. I'm, I'm qualified enough to help her there. Um, and Google helps me with, um, with my older daughter's work. Sure. So Google and YouTube are fantastic, helping me understand the Mayans and the Greeks and things. Um, but really, it's what I've found in COVID was I'm actually really grateful. I'm actually ridiculously grateful. I'm not just saying that as an airy fairy, gratitude is everything, personal development type vibe. Mm. I'm really grateful because what COVID really did for me, because I chose for it to do this for me, I want I I I made it so the meaning I chose in certain things would serve me rather than hurt me. I it has been fan- it's been fantastic to build a deeper relationship with my family. A yeah, great opportunity to spend more time with them, um, gr- greater focus in what I'm doing and the and the contribution I'm making to the world, um, and and really help me to connect because one other thing COVID's done is that there are a lot more people being a lot more vulnerable, which is what I love. I love people sharing their true selves, mm. their true, absolute true themness into the world, and the more of that. Uh, the more people feeling vulnerable, the more people are sharing those things. Sure. Yeah. I think you've hit on something very important. There has been a silver lining of sorts um, in COVID, you know, despite Mm. the the catastrophe and so many deaths and sickness and and so forth. But, you know, as you were saying, Chris, it has been a giant reset button uh, for a lot of work purposes uh, because clearly people that used to have this, horribly drudgerous filled lifestyle where they had to get up early, get on, get in a car, get in transit, spend hours and hours of time weekly commuting to an office and then crammed into an office for 10, 12 hours a day, then re- re- it's, reverse the it, process. It's, 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 it's going to change right? the face. Yeah. It's going to change the face of business because businesses yeah. that, who were forced to evolve, mm-hmm. they were forced to face certain things, certain mentalities they were forced to realize that the world is evolving um, and they were kind of pushed into this position where they had no other choice but to make remote working work. Right. Um, and, you know, the better a company did that, the better they were able to, I mean, just leadership uh, as a start. The people who were able to do true leadership, not management, that's a different thing, but real leadership that when the, your back is turned, they work harder, not less. Mm-hmm. Um, they work more diligently. Hard is a, a, a broad word, but they work more diligently and more focused. Uh, and they don't slack off when their back is turned just because they're at home. Um, the really great leaders were able to inspire that behavior. The, right. And the ones, that, the ones who had uh, built up teams based on I'm watching you um, – I haven't seen them do very well uh, because once the people were at home, they would have to, they'd almost lean into that and become almost micromanaging um, because they don't know any other way. Right. Uh, This really is the dawn of the greater leader, I believe. Yeah. And and again, an awakening of the workforce and dynamics. We all see there are certain benefits to being in the room with other people. Clearly we're we're Mm. human beings. We're social creatures by nature. There's a lot of synergy, serendipity that happens when you're around the water cooler, so to speak, in the hallways and so forth. On the other side of that, there's a hell of a lot of waste. I've seen it myself where you you are supposed to clock in, you know, from eight to six, let's say, right? For a typical white collar job, at least, right? Nine to five is no longer a thing. So uh, you're supposed to be there physically, like you said, typically somebody's watching you, you're supposed and, and so you fill your days with minutia and busy work that isn't real work. Whereas I think yep. the pandemic has shown that, like you said, a lot of people, when the boss isn't watching, you're actually more productive. And there are a lot of studies that have come out that people are getting more done 
Yeah. You know, it's so we're the, because they because they're into this mentality now of when the work's done I can leave right when the, like, uh, and and old bosses don't do that they don't say this is a this is a potentially a three a three hour job once it's done you can go like I, I only need the job done and it's it's task based yes and outcome based as opposed to filling up time based right so in your uh, case, as you said so, yeah, yeah in your example and I've been the same you know if you're a parent, especially during COVID it's been challenging in your case, you've got small children or one at least. Mm -hmm. And that is very challenging. Ours are at least, you know, preteen teenager. So they can feed themselves, clothe themselves, (laughs) sit in a room for hours at a time with computers, but the littler kids, it's really tough. So that means parents in this COVID era have had to adjust, get up at five 30 in the morning, knock out a couple of hours of work before breakfast, you know, then spend time, managing the kids learning and so forth and then clock back well, in in the evening like you said but you know well that's, that, well, that's the that, well that's the logistics of it yeah that's the logistics of it um you touched on an important point there of these kids are by themselves and now we're having parents working where the kids are uh, are right there but they're not spending time with them so now what you're actually dealing with is parents are having to step up their game um to be more emotionally connecting and understanding as parents to make sure the child doesn't go completely nuts because mm-hmm. they're they're just as isolated as we are as, as, as adults uh if not more so because they're, they're still working out the world and figuring it out and they've just got this drive to connect and understand things through their friends and through people around them yeah absolutely. Um, you, you've you've also got the entrepreneur guilt of uh, or business business person guilt of you know i'm i'm working but when i when i really want to spend time with the children and when i'm with the children i'm thinking about working um uh, and there's all kinds of thought-based problems of guilt and and uh, shame and and uh, that has an impact on productivity and action taking so yeah i mean that's it's no one's lying when they say that 90 percent of this game at least is is mindset and uh you know how you think how you feel and and uh and how you are uh because the ones who have done that well who have been able to process those emotions who have been able to understand their thoughts who have been able to not give in to that guilt um and be able to separate time with the children and now this is time for my business and time for the business uh, if they're employed to be able to separate that without the guilt coming in, without the, I should be over here versus I should be over here. Yeah. Um, and entrepreneurs are particularly, um, you know, bad about working all the time. And so mm. um, I've, yeah. I've been guilty of this over the years. And because, you know, typically, because if, if you're, like you said, if you're working for yourself, especially you got to eat what you, you know, you eat what you kill is, is a sort of the phrase, yeah. right? So if you're not working, you're probably not killing anything. You're not bringing in the, the dollars and the, and stuff like that. Yeah, so which, there's a lot of pressure which, on entrepreneurs, especially. Which, which creates this blind space, this blind spot. Um, because once you reach a certain point, your ability to rest and your ability to have downtime and create those boundaries with time actually give you greater productivity, greater effectiveness, not less. Mm-hmm. And so the, the, the mentality of if I work longer, I'll do better is actually, uh, although it may be intuitive, uh, it, it's completely wrong, mm-hmm. completely, com- completely 100% wrong. That actually, if you were to say, no, I'm working between this time, eight o'clock, and five o'clock is my work hours. After that, it is family time and only family time, and it's sacred. Someone like that doesn't have guilt because uh, about working because they're like, well, my family time's sacred, and it starts at five. Mm-hmm. Um, likewise, when they're with family, they don't think, oh, I really needed to get this done because they're like, no, I did everything I could in the time I had, which was eight till five. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and and so that's fine. I'll hit it again tomorrow, and so they don't have that kind of guilt or the or the filling the time problems that somebody who just works around the clock has. 
It's tough because, and I've been in this situation too, as an entrepreneur, I had, you know, one time I had a partner who was one of the most horrible people on the planet. So we eventually parted ways. That was not inevitable, but this was the type of person who would berate his other partners and people that worked for us for not working hard enough. Right. And for that, he meant, you know, he would tell people he works 24 seven, you know, and it's like, that's come on, that's impossible. But that was this hustle mentality that he tried to portray. And so to demonstrate that behavior, he would, you know, text me at all hours of the day in the middle of the night. And I don't even know if he did this, um, you know, pre-scheduled or what, but it was just maddening. And so, you know, you don't want to get to the point Well, first of all, you have to set boundaries. And so that's very difficult for a lot of people. Um, especially if you work in a big corporation and you feel like you have to, you know, live up to some expectation or whatever on their end. Yeah. But I think that's incumbent on people. And now COVID kind of gives you a pass. You can say, look, I have kids or I have other circumstances. I'm only going to be able to work intently these hours and it may be split up, yes. but tell people that. And then when you get the emails or texts from your boss at one in the morning, say, you know what? I'm sorry. I turn my phone off at night because I actually sleep or, you know, yes. I, I have, yeah. these are my boundaries. If it's a catastrophe and you have to get, if, a if it's an me, emergency and yeah. this is the criteria yeah. of an emergency, this is the bat phone building number. on fire. You <laughs> yeah, know, that's right. But otherwise, please respect this. And then we, you know, if you, if you have people that you work with that don't respect that, then ultimately you need to polish up your resume or start looking elsewhere because that's not a happy life. Trust me. No, it's not. And, and, and you, and you did this great thing that, you know, you touched on it, this mentality, this hustle mentality of needing to be on all the time. Um, you know, it's, it just, it just causes damage and you end up projecting onto others. You know, I'm working this hard. You should work this hard. And what you end up doing, if you are on that train, the, you end up building your business becomes your life. Mm -hmm. It is your life. And there is a massive danger in that, especially if it's an entrepreneur and it's your business. There's a huge danger in all the excitement, all the passion, all the fulfillment is coming from your business. Well, at a certain point, and this is why I work with six figures, seven figures and above, because this is usually the time when the chaos is starting to go down and the stability and repeated patterns are starting to come up because a seven figure business is not as chaotic and hustling as a, as a lower level six figure business or below mm. um at a seven figure it's all about repetition mm-hmm. it's all about systems process yes. you know process right boring things <laughs> and entrepreneurs generally don't do well with boring and when you have made your business your life and your life is that of excitement and hustle this is where you find people growing their business to an amazing level, but then completely blowing it up, either blowing it up or letting it die. You know, not, you know, they'll, they'll have their best month ever and then they'll stop making offers. Mm. They'll have this record breaking quarter and then they'll, they'll close down the whole division or they'll close down the whole segment and they'll, they'll completely change their offer, completely changing their niche because they just, feel it's aligned to go a different way. Mm. It's not that they feel, it is that they feel it's aligned. It's, you know, I don't want to disregard their feeling, but where that feeling generally comes from is through this action, through this action of living through the business and having your fulfillment through the business uh, and all the passion and excitement from the business, that that means that the business has to stay exciting. Mm. So yeah. boring tasks tend not to get done <laughs> and then, right. uh, or they get, or you procrastinate on them or, or you just don't do them. Uh, and, and you just leave yourself that kind of, uh, that vulnerable to, to, for it to be, for it to break. Yeah, um, man, that you've really touched a nerve there because I know a lot of yeah. entrepreneurs that fit that mold where they've built these killer businesses. <laughs> and just when it looks like they're riding the killer wave, they, they just abandon ship or, yep. or, you know, and then you ask them about why did you give up that business? That is yeah, it's just not thing. feeling right anymore. And it's like, I got to move on to the next thing. Like why that is yeah. now it's a profitable, cool business. I, I knew one guy who started a clo- clothing company, you know, which was based out of bowl, uh, Jackson hole, uh, Wyoming, which is one of the most iconic, beautiful places in America. Right. 
And he just yeah. gets bored and moves on to the next thing, sells the company, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that dude, that that was like a – and he's – you know, a lot of entrepreneurs – uh, make this excuse. Well, it was turning into a lifestyle business. Like I want to. There you go. Now, job- that's the thing. What's that's wrong the with thing. the lifestyle business? You know, let me because ask you we, that. Because <laughs> entrepreneurs, good question. Because entrepreneurs aren't made that way. Yeah, they want. Oh, they Gen- want the giant. You know, multiple figure. Gen- generally, revenue. well, it's sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's this this uh, d- deep desire of a status of seven figure millionaire. Blah blah blah. Generally speaking, it's part of who they are. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I'll always use the terms generally speaking. There are exception to every rule. Um, but I have a theory that most entrepreneurs are actually born from some kind of childhood trauma mm. um, or, or childhood conditioning if the word trauma is too, uh, too offensive to people to hear. Um, where I simply mean that at a certain point, you didn't have needs met that really needed to be met Therefore, you developed a personality where you could get them met in other ways through achievement, through accomplishment, you know, gaining attention, gaining intensity as opposed to intimacy. So where you can't get the thing, you get the substitute for the Mm -hmm. thing. So if people can't feel intimacy because it, it doesn't feel safe for them, they'll generally go for intensity. If people don't um, can't fully feel love um, in its full capacity, and I mean full, unconditional, unconditional, there are no conditions. A lot of people have trouble with that, and so what they turn to is they turn for attention, mm-hmm. and that that means when they stop f- getting attention, they stop feeling wanted, they stop feeling loved, uh, because they're attaching their worth. Uh, I tell you, self worth is tangled up in all of this. Um, an identity, they attach their worth to the attention they're receiving in any one time. Mm-hmm. Well, that, that that affects you at all levels. You know, if you want to show up online, uh, if you're an online influencer or that kind of personality, um, that's the, one of the first blocks to come up usually. Mm-hmm. What if I show up and people judge me? What if I they I show up and I actually let them see the full version of me? Yeah. Oh, oh my God, like they're going to see just how broken, defective and, and wrong that I am yes. because I don't feel like I'm full. You hit it on um, the head it's a, before. It's the imposter syndrome. And I think everybody, yeah, well, that's one of the names for it. Yeah. I think everybody has that, you know, even the most hard charging entrepreneurs, business people I've known in the past that mask that with amazing amounts of bravado and bullshit and, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. putting people down and, and power plays and all that kind of thing. I think some of those most powerful people, um, even though they were successful on paper, were some of the biggest assholes. And and also, I think they were broken inside and they wouldn't admit it. But other people could, you s- could see you've I, got you've got Napoleon I, I, complex or whatever the hell it is. But you've got some issues. Absolutely. And so everybody absolutely. should should uh, face that because those people, even the ones that are super successful. Think about Steve Jobs, for crying out loud. I mean, he just yeah. beat people up for decades to get work done. Awesome because he changed the world. But at what cost? Right. Right. Well, a lot of these, um, I mean, you could you could put that into a romantic setting, and that's a toxic, abusive relationship. Mm-hmm. Now, there's a belief that in any toxic relationship, especially if you're in one, you believe there is a strong one and a weak one. The strong one is bullying the weak one. But I actually look at it from the other way around. Because if the strong one was really strong, if the strong one was truly confident, truly centered, truly grounded, they would have no need to take the strength from the other person. Mm. They would have no void to fill. Right. Brilliant. Generally speaking, in a toxic relationship, the one who's doing the bullying and the beating down is the most insecure one. And the person taking the beating and coming back from it and coming back from it and coming back from it, who doesn't recognize that that in itself is incredible resiliency and grit if they were actually as weak as they believed they were and they felt like they were weak because they're taking this this beating um, verbally or emotionally or physically, it doesn't really matter. They're taking a hit. If they were actually as weak as they deep down felt like they were, they wouldn't be able to keep coming back. Mm. 
they wouldn't be able to keep having that resistance, uh, that resiliency to keep coming back. And so generally speaking, uh, a toxic relationship, whether it be in the workplace or uh, in the home, is, is always a strong one and a weak one, but it's never the order that you think it is. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting. It's the weak it's... one bullying the strong one. Sure. And they're just not realizing that's the way around it is. You you said a word, Chris, that sort of resonates highly with me is toxicity. Um, I f personally think there's a hell of a lot of toxicity in entrepreneurship across the board. Um, most successful. Well, there would be. Yeah. Most successful entrepreneurs that I personally know uh, well have had a lot of alcoholism, um, yeah. self-abuse, divorce rates are extremely high. Um, and these are ch hard charging, high performing people, right? But well, yeah, there, but, there's but a lot of damage on, as that you goes said, at what cost? Yeah, there's a they as leave you said, a, at what cost? Yeah, they leave a wake. Like if you're in a boat and mm. you see you look behind and you see the the blades churning and all the dead fish going around. That's what a lot of entrepreneurs do. So I I have this as feeling said, yeah a, you're, lot, a lot of entrepreneurship comes from trauma yeah because this is that need to prove themselves at any cost that need to accomplish at any cost the mm. need to achieve at any cost the need to gain attention at any cost because they are missing that need that need is not being fulfilled uh when you talk about alcohol uh i mean you could also talk about alcohol you could talk about drugs you could talk about gaming you can talk about social media addiction. Any addiction is really an escape, a temporary yes. escape from feeling the thing they're feeling, which is in this case, inadequacy. And entrepreneurship. Generally is, speaking, it's yeah, inadequacy. And entrepreneurship is a huge high and a huge low. I mean, it is a massive, yes. it's a crack hit uh, for anybody who tries it, you know, especially and, in the early. And, and, and words like 70% like of businesses fail in the first five years. That is a red. That's a that's a red cloth to a, an entrepreneur bull because it's like, well, I'm going to be the one. I'm going to be the percentage that makes it, and that will yeah. prove that I'm now worthy. That's, it'll prove that I actually have something to offer the world, and that's that's a lot. A lot of people are doing. They're they're just proving something for themselves, um, but there's there's a there's a flip and a damage that that causes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, both to others and themselves, it really hurts them a lot of the time. It really hurts them. Well, Chris, you were spot on when you so told me before that many of the shows you're on say you could have talked to Chris for hours on end. I could certainly do the same, but I want to be respectful <laughs> of listeners time and um, cap it off here. But, you know, is there any parting words of wisdom before we leave um, in terms of this sort of vein we've gone down helping people overcome trauma so they can be better entrepreneurs and then wrap up by telling us where we can learn more about you? Absolutely. Yes. Um, yeah, I think that the, the first step is always awareness. Uh, the first step is always coming to terms that if you are trying to prove yourself for yourself, that it's only going to cause more damage later on down the line. And if you really want to have a lot more money in your life, a lot more impact in the world, you want to look after your families and that kind of thing, it really starts with how much self-love and self-worth you already have uh, and the higher that is generally speaking the easier the other things will be um as for where to find me you can find me on instagram uh, i'll send all my links to you uh brandon if you want to share those around but you can find me on instagram at chris underscore richards underscore official facebook you can find me just search chris richards or you can search for atomic growth um and you'll find me there um but generally speaking i'm on most platforms uh, and i'm not too hard to find excellent I to be. i'll link all of those over at the show notes page at goforlaunch.io slash show 127 chris richards thank you so much Beautiful. for all your insights today um i think that a lot of people should listen to this and uh take heart and then probably reach out to you if they felt any um twinge of truth to what we've been talking about if you're an entrepreneur you probably have some trauma that might be getting in the way absolutely and and, and i will leave one final thought um for that understand and this is my mentality that there are no defective people there are only people who were taught that they were defective mm. every single person is a worthwhile wonderful human being that has simply learned the wrong lesson at some point in time and just needs to relearn the lesson. 
There are no defective people. There are no unworthy people. Great words to end on. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you, Brandon.